All right. Well, awesome. Uh, we've got a pretty decent crowd. We're a little bit over uh, the noon time now, so I say let's go ahead and get started. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending this hour with me. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Andrew Johnson. I'm one of the psychiatry residents here. I studied medicine at the University of Washington, and I'm currently in my fourth and final year of psychiatric training. And today I'm excited to be giving my grand rounds talk on the circadian rhythm, the cycle of light and the hormone of darkness. And really the title says it all. This is a talk on the circadian rhythm, really with an emphasis on that circadian sleep system and how the system is influenced by both light and melatonin. And so for my presentation today, I'll start with a general overview of what a circadian rhythm is, why it's important. Then we'll discuss the intrinsic and extrinsic influences on our circadian system, which will of course highlight how both light and melatonin influence our clocks. Then we'll identify the various circadian rhythm sleep disorders. And to wrap up, we'll have a brief discussion of some things to consider if and when to use light and melatonin as treatments for circadian sleep disorders. So questions are of course always welcome, but just for the general flow of the presentation, I'd ask that you please hold all your questions and comments until the end so I can get through all the material. And I have no financial disclosures. So we live on this planet that rotates on its axis every 24 hours, creating these cyclic environmental changes, most notably a light phase and a dark phase that we've labeled day and night. Now, these rotations, this cycle of light and darkness has been occurring for billions of years now, since the beginning of life, really with unwavering consistency. And through evolution, life has essentially learned to adapt to this cycle in ways that optimize biologic processes. And we call these biochemical, physiological, and behavioral adaptations to the rotations of the Earth, the circadian rhythm. And in fact, the term circadian comes from the Latin roots circa and diem. Circa meaning about or approximately and diem meaning a day. So circadian rhythm quite literally means about a day rhythm. And the purpose is twofold. Purpose one is to coordinate our complex internal biologic processes. And the second is to anticipate those consistent daily environmental changes. And so right now and throughout the day, our circadian systems are anticipating those daily environmental changes and coordinating our complex biologic processes to help us run as efficiently as possible. Now, these include things like our sleep-wake cycle, metabolism, appetite changes, things we're very aware of on a daily basis, but they also include things we're not as consciously aware of daily, like hormone production, waste excretion, autonomic regulation like our blood pressure, even cell division. And these are just a few examples depicted above. And you can see all of their unique 24 hour biologic rhythms or periodicities. The point being that almost every aspect of our biology operates on a circadian cycle. And that brings us to sleep, probably the most overt of all the circadian rhythms and likely the one of the most interest to us as mental health providers. As we know, it's critical for brain development, cognitive functions like learning and memory, physical health, and of course, mental health and well-being. Now, overall, the sleep-wake cycle is thought to be governed by two major processes, a homeostatic process and a circadian process depicted by this figure in the upper right. Now, the homeostatic process is simply our sleep drive or our sleep debt. Basically, the longer you go without sleep, the stronger your drive to sleep becomes. So every morning when we wake up, these yellow arrows will start to build and accumulate throughout the day until at one point we'll fall asleep and then they'll begin to dissipate again. But it's interesting, we don't feel fatigue and sleepiness on this linear basis. In fact, most of us might feel more energized, more alert and aware as the day goes on, having our best hours anywhere from like the late morning all the way into the early evening time. And this is due to that second regulatory process, our circadian alerting system. And this governs our daily arousal. So we see also that this signal increases throughout the day and actually reaches its peak in the evening time when our homeostatic drive for sleep is also often at its highest. Well, this zone of maximum circadian arousal is referred to as the wake maintenance zone, as it allows us to maintain wakefulness and alertness through that evening time, despite having a fairly strong homeostatic drive to sleep at this time. 
Well, we see that this zone has been closely followed by the rise in plasma melatonin and then a subsequent drop in our arousal signal, which then allows our homeostatic sleep drive to then take over during the night. And our arousal continues to drop until it reaches its trough for nadir around 3 to 6 a.m., which interestingly also coincides with the circadian trough of core body temperature, that our body temperature also operates on a circadian rhythm and tends to dip in those early hours of the morning. Well, this zone of minimal alertness in core body temperature is called the sleep maintenance zone, as it allows us to maintain sleep throughout the night, even though our homeostatic drive for sleep is fairly low at this point. And so it's these two governing forces that are thought to help regulate our sleep-wake cycle and essentially allows us to be what's known as a diurnal creature or awake and alert during that day phase and then asleep consolidated throughout that dark phase or the nighttime. And just a few more things I want to point out, because melatonin and core body temperature have these robust rhythms and correlations with our sleep-wake cycle, they make for great biomarkers for laboratory and clinical work to help us understand how an individual's circadian clock is embedded into the solar day. And so referring to this left-hand column, melatonin onset, or that initial rise of plasma melatonin in the evening is probably the biomarker most commonly used as an index or proxy for someone's circadian timing. And the onset is typically around 9 p.m. in the average person. Sleep often occurs within two hours of its onset. Now this can be collected through blood plasma, saliva, even urine, and it's typically referred to as the dim light melatonin onset or DILMO because melatonin is very sensitive to light exposure and has to be collected in dim light or no light in order to be accurate. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about why that is in just a little bit, but I wanted to introduce you to the DILMO here as I make reference to it quite a few times in this talk. Okay, so we know what a circadian rhythm is and that it helps regulate this vast array of daily biologic processes, including sleep and wake. But how exactly does it work? Is this like an intrinsic process driven by some type of internal biologic clock? Or are we mainly just reacting to these daily environmental changes? And the answer is actually a little bit of both. So starting with the intrinsic side of things, I've listed five experiments here from the past that explore this question of intrinsic versus extrinsic control, where environmental cues were changed or removed in some ways to see if those biologic oscillations would still occur on that 24 hour basis. And there are many more than these five studies that I listed, but I wanted to provide some historical context and just show that these studies have ranged from things like removing or changing light dark cues for plants to see if they would still fold and unfold to scientists literally isolating themselves in dark caves for days to weeks on end to studies that artificially change the day length anywhere from 22 hours to 28 hours and then measured biomarkers like core body temperature and DILMO to see if they would still correspond to that 24 hour day or if they would just quickly conform to these artificial day lengths. And these pictures from the left are actually from that third experiment on the right by Jurgen Ashoff. Happened in the 70s, where over many years he secluded hundreds of volunteers in these old World War II bunkers for about two weeks away from any social or natural light dark cues. And we can see him walking the participant into the bunker on this top picture, and then below a volunteer coming out of the bunker after almost two weeks of this seclusion. And, you know, we can see the general results of all of these studies highlighted in red. The main point that I want to make is that research has shown that our circadian clocks are in fact intrinsic and will continue to oscillate on about a 24 hour basis, even in the absence of normal environmental cues. And in fact, from some of the later, more sophisticated studies, they were able to actually determine the frequency of these intrinsic clocks is about 24.18 hours in the average person. So just a little bit longer than that solar day. And we actually refer to the frequency of this intrinsic clock as our free running clock. And while it was understood that our clocks were intrinsic, ran at this rate of just over 24 hours, we didn't fully appreciate how this happened. 
until about two decades ago. And actually there were three American scientists who uncovered the genetic and molecular basis for how these intrinsic clocks operated. And they did so in their studies of the Drosophila melanogaster, or common fruit fly. And we can see the genetic diagram there in the upper right corner. It's actually pretty cool. They were just recently awarded the Nobel Prize back in 2017 for their work in this field. And from their work, this genetic clock was later characterized in mammals and humans as shown in the diagram below. And we can see that even though a few of the names are a little bit different, there's a few more kind of key components, the actual process is remarkably conserved between species. And these, of course, are very simplified diagrams of that genetic process. We're not gonna go into any great detail here as that alone could consume the whole hour, not be super high yield for our purposes. But the general concept involves a transcriptional translational feedback loop where you have certain genes, in this instance, clock and BMAL1, that will come together in the nucleus to promote gene expression. And this gene expression will include the expression of certain inhibitor genes, in this case, period and cryptochrome. And after expression, these inhibitor genes will ultimately feed back into the nucleus and inhibit further gene expression from taking place. So expression is turned off. Well, over time, these inhibitors will degrade, and when they do, gene expression is then resumed again by clock and BMAL1, which again includes the expression of these inhibitor genes, and the cycle repeats itself over and over. So basically, you have these periods where gene expression is on, and these periods where gene expression is off. And we've learned that these genes, this molecular process, is present in almost every cell in our body and plays a primary role in segregating the expression of particular genes at particular times in particular organs and tissues to help enact all of those various circadian functions that we talked about earlier, including our sleep-wake cycle. And so kind of what this picture illustrates, our bodies are somewhat comprised of all these peripheral circadian clocks in our organs and tissues. And at the center of all this activity is the suprachiasmatic nuclei, that this is a small paired nucleus in our hypothalamus located here in our brain, which serves as the master clock or the master oscillator as it provides that intrinsic pacemaker for all of these peripheral clocks to synchronize to, as well as helps to drive our sleep-wake rhythm. And so that's the intrinsic side of things in a nutshell. The big takeaways being that our circadian clocks are indeed intrinsic through this genetic process that's essentially ubiquitous within all of our cells and ultimately synchronized to a master clock, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which then oscillates with this frequency or periodicity of about 24.18 hours in the average person, even in the absence of normal environmental cues. It's free running. And while all of this is 100% true, it's not entirely complete. It does raise an issue that needs to be addressed. A lot of you have probably already thought about this, that since our intrinsic clocks run at this frequency longer than 24 hours, longer than the solar day, if we solely relied on this, we would essentially find ourselves in what is known as a circadian drift. In other words, a situation where all of our daily circadian rhythms, including our sleep-wake cycle depicted by this figure on the right, would essentially drift or occur just a little bit later and later each day, really in perpetuity. Unfortunately, most of us have noticed that this is not the case. You may go to sleep a little bit earlier, a little bit later from day to day, but it's likely that you're not in this constant state of drifting. And the reason for this is that while our clocks are intrinsically running, they can also be altered by extrinsic influences. And these influences include things like light exposure, meal times, other forms of cognitive and physical stimulation. And they're known as synchronizers or zeitgebers, a German word that means timekeepers, as they help keep our intrinsic clocks within that 24-hour light-dark cycle so that we're not constantly drifting out of phase with the solar day. And you'll notice that light exposure here has its own special highlight. And that's because without a doubt, the most powerful zeitgeber, the one that exerts the most influence on our intrinsic clocks is light. And so that's gonna be our focus moving forward. Now to understand the effects of light on our circadian system, it's important to have a little understanding of what light is. 
that briefly light is an, an electromagnetic radiation that has properties of waves in a very small spectral range of 380 to 730 nanometers, sandwiched here between UV waves and infrared waves on either side. Now, looking at this top figure, you can see that those shorter wavelengths create a more purple or blue light, while those longer wavelengths create a more yellow, orange, or red light. Now, all known effects of light on our circadian system are mediated by the retina. So referring to the bottom figure, the retina is this fine layer of nerve tissue at the back of our eyes that contains three types of photoreceptors. The first two we're quite familiar with. These are cones and rods, which are responsible for image forming vision, basically the things we see with our eyes. But then we have a third type of photoreceptor called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or the IPRGCs. Now these receptors, they don't process images, but rather they're primarily responsible for absorbing and then sending those light signals to our master clocks, the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Now remember our clocks are intrinsically running, so light doesn't turn our biologic rhythms on or off. Rather these light signals, they exert their influence on our intrinsic clocks through what is known as phase shifting. That light can either phase advance our intrinsic clocks or phase delay it. And essentially a phase advance means to speed up that intrinsic clock so that all of our circadian periodicities like melatonin rhythm for body temperature, sleep-wake cycle, as depicted by this figure on the left, will advance to earlier times or phases in the subsequent days. So we're more prone to fall asleep earlier and we're more prone to wake up earlier. And phase advances happen with light exposure in the morning time, which makes sense if you think about it, we're diurnal creatures supposed to be awake and alert during that light phase. So that light signal is telling our suprachiasmatic nuclei, whoa, it is daytime now. You need to be awake. You need to be alert. Start going to bed a little bit earlier so you're not sleeping through this light phase. And then a phase delay is the exact opposite. So it will slow down our intrinsic clock so that all of our periodicities like our sleep-wake times are delayed to later times in the subsequent days. So we'll be more prone to fall asleep later and wake up later. And phase delays happen with evening and nighttime light exposure, which also makes sense if you think about it, that light signal is telling our master clocks, whoa, it's still daytime right now. We need to push that sleep time back so you're not falling asleep too early during this light phase. And when our circadian periodicities like sleep-wake shown here are aligned with that solar day, we're said to be entrained. And this is the ultimate goal of phase shifting is to essentially be in harmony with that light-dark cycle created by the rotations of the earth so that we're sleeping during the dark phase and then are awake during the light phase or the daytime. And there are actually four variables of light that impact the direction and magnitude of phase shifts the timing of light, intensity of light, duration of light exposure, and then the spectrum of light. And these can actually be plotted on what's called a phase response curve, where this x-axis here shows the time of the day, while this y-axis shows the direction and magnitude of the phase shift. So up meaning a phase advance and down meaning a phase delay, again, depending on the time of day. And so going through these four variables, we just talked about timing a little bit, but again, we see that for timing, light exposure in that morning time is gonna cause a phase advance on our intrinsic clocks. And we actually see that the magnitude of this advance will slowly diminish throughout the day. And as we enter that late afternoon, early evening time, the very same light exposure is gonna cause a phase delay on our intrinsic clocks throughout the night. Next is light intensity. The higher the intensity of light, the greater the phase shift is gonna be, again, depending on the time of day. And on the right, I listed out various light intensities for your reference. You can see that like a full daylight or a bright sunny day has an intensity of about 10 to 20,000 lux. We'll compare this to say living room lighting, which is about 150 lux. So much, much less intense. And as you can imagine, much less effective at say phase advancing our internal clocks in that morning time if we're solely confined to that indoor lighting. Next is duration. The longer the duration of light exposure, the bigger that phase shift is gonna be, again, depending on the time of day. And then finally, the spectrum of light we're actually most sensitive to those lower frequency wavelengths of blue light. And this is due to the fact that each of our three types of photoreceptors, cones, rods, and IPRGCs, contain what's called a photopigment, 
which is the substance that's actually responsible for absorbing that light and then converting it to an electrical signal for our brains. And we can see in this bottom figure that each type of photoreceptor contains a specific photopigment that's best able to absorb light in a specific spectrum. And so again, referring to this figure, we see that the photopigment of our IPRGCs it's called melanopsin, which as we can see, it's most sensitive or most effective at absorbing light in this range of uh, 460 to 480 nanometers, which just so happens to fall in this blue light range. And that's the physiology of why we're most sensitive to blue light, which makes sense physiologically. But then the question still remains, well, why is this the case? Why did we evolve our melanopsin in this way to be most sensitive to blue light opposed to maybe these other waves of light? And the answer is thought to go back with our relationship to the sun again, that the sun emits all wavelengths of light at all times during the day. However, when it's low on the horizon as it is in the early morning and late evening, it has to pass through more atmosphere, which means more molecules to scatter those shorter violet and blue light waves away so that by the time the light reaches the retina, only those longer wavelengths are present. And this is why sunrises and sunsets often appear yellow, orange, or red to our eyes. Now contrast this to the peak hours of the day where light has more direct pathway to earth, needs to travel through less atmosphere, allowing those shorter blue wavelengths to reach our retinas in much higher number. So from this perspective, it can make sense why we might have evolved a greater sensitivity to blue light as these wavelengths are more strongly correlated with the peak hours of the light phase or the daytime. And just to solidify how important light is for our circadian systems, remember that circadian drift we talked about earlier. Well, this actually happens, and it happens to a specific population of people, and that's blind or non-sighted individuals, that since they don't have functional retinas to send those light signals to their master clocks, they do rely on their intrinsic free-running clock, which as we know, runs a little bit longer than that solar day. So they can live in this constant state of circadian drift where their periodicities like sleep wake occur just a little bit later each day. And this actually has a name, it's called non 24 hour sleep wake disorder or free running disorder. And it's one of four intrinsic circadian sleep disorders. We'll talk about the others in just a bit. But this curve occurs in about 60 to 70% of non-sighted individuals. And it's associated with a fairly predictable set of clinical symptoms, you know, fatigue, sleep deprivation, work and social impairment, psychiatric comorbidity. And as is the case with all intrinsic circadian sleep disorders, the diagnosis is largely clinical, but does require either a sleep log or actigraphy monitoring for at least 14 days to fully establish the person's sleep pattern. And just for your reference, actigraphy is a small non-invasive sensor that can be worn to monitor human rest activity cycles. And here's just a few actigraphy um, readings from some non-sighted patients with non-24 hour sleep wake disorder. And you can actually see the circadian drift happening. Their sleep times and their wake times occurring just a little bit later and later each day. Again, illustrating how important that light signal is at phase shifting and in training our intrinsic circadian clocks. Now, if light is a signal to our brains that it's daytime, melatonin is the exact opposite, that this is a hormone synthesized and secreted by the pineal gland in our brains that signals the dark phase of the day or the nighttime, which is why it's often referred to or gets its nickname as the hormone of darkness. Now, true to its nickname, it follows a very robust circadian rhythm where it's pretty much non-existent in the blood plasma during those daytime hours and then rises throughout the night. Now recall that its onset or that dim light melatonin onset is typically around 9 to 10 p.m. in the average person and sleep will usually happen within two hours of the melatonin onset in the average person. Well, this is the hormone of darkness. You can imagine that light has a fairly interesting relationship with melatonin and actually impacts it in two distinct ways. The first one we just talked about, where light exposure through the suprachiasmatic nuclei can actually entrain our melatonin circadian rhythm through phase shifting. So light in the morning time can phase advance that melatonin rhythm, light at the nighttime can phase delay it. But secondly, in addition to phase shifting at any time during the dark phase, when melatonin is actively being synthesized and secreted, 
Exposure to light during this time will also acutely suppress that synthesis and secretion of melatonin. And this makes sense if you think about it. If melatonin is a darkness signal, we don't really want it around competing with any type of light signal. And we can see here that intensities of light starting at around 60 to 130 lux will partially suppress that melatonin synthesis. And then around 2000 lux is required for complete suppression. And this figure on the bottom right just shows how swiftly this can happen. That the light in this study was about 6,000 lux in intensity. And we see within a 90 minute light exposure, that plasma melatonin was essentially suppressed from its peak all the way back down to its daytime levels. And here's a diagram for how this happens. Essentially during that dark phase, this excitatory neurotransmitter noradrenaline is released which will then bind primarily to these beta adrenergic receptors on the pineal gland, which then promotes melatonin synthesis and secretion into our CSF and um, blood plasma. Well, if a light signal is received during this time, the suprachiasmatic nuclei will then send an inhibitory signal, GABA, to our paraventricular nucleus that ultimately turns off this downstream release of noradrenaline. So there's no more pineal gland activation, no more melatonin synthesis. And interestingly, this is why beta blockers, particularly lipophilic beta blockers like propranolol, are thought to suppress melatonin synthesis as they block these beta adrenergic receptors on the pineal gland from receiving this noradrenaline excitatory signal. And there's actually a very rare chromosomal disorder. It's called smith mcginnis syndrome. We're not gonna go into a ton of detail, but one very interesting aspect of smith mcginnis is that the melatonin rhythm is flip-flopped. So it's inappropriately suppressed at nighttime and then synthesized and secreted during the daytime, which is thought to help contribute to a lot of the sleep and behavioral issues associated with this disorder. But the clinical correlate is actually that one of the treatments for this disorder is to give them a beta blocker like acetabutylol or propranolol during the daytime to help suppress that inappropriate melatonin production during the daytime. Okay, so we keep calling melatonin the hormone of darkness, but what does it actually do? Well, in regard to the sleep-wake cycle, it's thought to have two primary functions. One is sleep promotion and the other is circadian entrainment. Now for sleep promotion, when melatonin's in circulation during that dark phase, it will bind to receptors on our suprachiasmatic nuclei, which is then thought to help suppress that circadian arousal signal and facilitate our homeostatic sleep drive. And this is why, if you recall from this graph from earlier, that rise in melatonin is so strongly inversely correlated with that decrease in our alerting signal, because it's thought to help contribute to this. But then secondly, just like light, melatonin can actually help entrain our intrinsic clocks through phase shifting. That during circulation, melatonin will bind to receptors on our suprachiasmatic nuclei, causing either a phase advance or a phase delay, again, depending on the time of day. And we see here a phase response curve that actually compares both light and melatonin to each other. And you can see they're essentially the exact same, just 180 degrees out of phase with each other. So we see that melatonin during that late afternoon, early evening time is going to cause a phase advance to our clocks, opposed to light, which we know causes a strong strong phase delay. Well, then we also see that excess melatonin in our plasma in that morning time is going to cause a phase delay opposed to light, which we know causes a strong phase advance with morning time, excuse me, morning time exposure. And they've actually demonstrated these phase response principles with exogenous melatonin as well. And this is one of them where this solid black line here shows the phase response curve of a 0.5 milligram dose of melatonin. This dotted black line shows the phase response curve for a three milligram dose of melatonin. And this very thin black line here shows the endogenous melatonin rhythm. And so I put this red bar here just so you can more easily reference that DILMO or that endogenous melatonin onset point. And then the bar below just summarizes the general results of the study. And there are two main points that I wanna make about exogenous melatonin phase shifting. Now, point number one is that phase advances from exogenous melatonin are typically higher in magnitude when given earlier in relationship to our endogenous melatonin onset. So based on the literature, this can be anywhere from like one to six hours prior to that DILMO or melatonin onset. And we see in this specific study, 
that the exogenous melatonin given about three hours prior to DILMO causes the greatest phase advance of about 1.5 hours. The second point I want to make is that phase shifting does not appear to be dose dependent. Again, we see in the phase response curve that this 0.5 milligram dose is just as effective at phase advancing as this three milligram dose. They both advance the clocks by the same magnitude of about 1.5 hours after three days of melatonin administration. And this has been shown in a lot of studies that higher doses of melatonin don't increase that magnitude of phase shifts. This is another study to just reiterate both those principles. Again, we see that two doses of melatonin, 0.3 milligrams and then three milligrams, given two hours prior to the DILMO for two weeks, advance the circadian clock by about one hour, regardless of the dose. And in, then in the same study, these two doses given 5.5 hours prior to DILMO, again for two weeks, advanced the clock at a higher magnitude of about 2.5 hours, but again, there was no difference based on the dose. So kind of a good clinical summary would be to say, melatonin phase shifting appears to be time dependent, but not dose dependent. Ooh, okay, so that's the story of light and melatonin in a nutshell. The big takeaways being that these are two powerful circadian signals that help to entrain our intrinsic clocks through phase shifting so that we're sleeping during the dark phase and then awake during the light phase. And in a natural environment, these two signals in tandem work incredibly well at keeping us in harmony with that solar day. After all, evolution has essentially had since the beginning of life to fine tune us to this natural environment. Unfortunately, nothing lasts forever. Um, and as we know, we've experienced incredible advances in technology over a very short period of time that has essentially removed us from that natural environment. One of these um, advances we know being the uh, invention of artificial light, which since its invention has just become more powerful, more prominent, really to the point that it's quite literally pervaded human civilization across the globe. And so with these modern day technological advances, those extrinsic influences, those Zeitgebers that were once so effective at entraining our intrinsic clocks in that natural environment have in many ways become extrinsic disruptions. You know, we work and live in these buildings that have essentially decoupled us from the natural light dark cycle, blocking out that bright morning light and at the same time inundating us with that artificial light during the evening and nighttime. We have things like jet lag and shift work disorder. Even our modern day culture in some ways can glamorize or promote circadian disruptions as somewhat of a virtue in the name of being like a tireless worker or a party animal. And we know that this is only half the story as well, that while our intrinsic clocks are susceptible to extrinsic influences and disruptions, they're also intrinsically running and thus can all also malfunction on an intrinsic level. And when they do this, it's referred to as an intrinsic circadian rhythm sleep disorder. And as I alluded to earlier, there are actually four of them. There's delayed phase sleep disorder, advanced phase sleep disorder, non 24 hour sleep disorder, and irregular sleep wake rhythm disorder. And I want to touch on each of them just briefly so you can understand the general differences in presentation and pathophysiology. We're not going to spend a ton of time on any of them, but notice that delayed phase sleep disorder has its own special highlight here. Now, this is because it's the most common of the intrinsic circadian sleep disorders and likely the one that we'll see the most as mental health care providers. And so we're going to be focusing primarily on this in our discussion moving forward as that's most likely going to be highest yield. And so again, delayed phase sleep disorder, the most common of the intrinsic circadian sleep disorders, will typically emerge in teenage years and then persist into adulthood. People with this disorder have an abnormally delayed sleep episode relative to the dark phase of the solar cycle. So in essence, these are those extreme or pathologic night owls. They'll fall asleep anywhere from like 1 to 6 a.m. and then arouse anywhere from like 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., leading to very chronic, quite often severe sleep restriction when they have to conform to that 8 to 5 modern-day work-life schedule. And this raises important point number one, that when released from scheduling constraints like morning work, school, other types of obligations, their sleep duration and quality is typically normal. It's just delayed. 
We also see that there's a high degree of psychiatric comorbidity associated with this disorder. In one study, up to 70% of patients had an access one psychiatric diagnosis. So again, these are patients that were prone to see as mental health care providers. And this leads to an important point number two, that this can often be overlooked or mistaken as something else, like a mood-induced sleep disturbance, chronic sleep onset insomnia. So it can take some diligence on our end to be on the lookout for this and actually tease out some of the patient's longstanding sleep patterns in order to recognize this, especially since our patients aren't always the best at communicating or articulating their sleep patterns to us. So the pathophysiology is not fully characterized, but it is thought to be this combination of both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. And this shot, this slide illustrates the inner weave of these factors where we see that patients are thought to have some type of underlying biologic predisposition to delayed phase sleep, which is then exacerbated by their behavioral patterns like delayed physical activity, social interactions, and meal times in combination with these extrinsic factors like absence of morning time light and excess evening time light, all of which is thought to cause this disproportionately strong phase delay in relationship to phase advance that can essentially self-perpetuate this delayed sleep tendency. So just put a person in a vicious cycle essentially. And a lot of research is currently being done into the potential intrinsic contributions of delayed phase sleep disorder. And one gene of specific interest is this cryptochrome one gene. So recall that cryptochrome is in the family of inhibitor genes. They help turn that gene expression off during the cycle. And they've actually found a specific gain of function mutation in the cryptochrome one gene that will cause it to bind more tightly to that gene promoter complex, this clock and BMAL1, which is thought to then lengthen our intrinsic circadian clocks and subsequently will promote these delayed sleep wake tendencies in an individual. So next is advanced phase sleep disorder. This is essentially the exact opposite where patients have abnormally advanced sleep relative to the solar cycle. So they'll fall asleep anywhere from like 6 to 9 p.m., wake up anywhere from like 2 to 5 a.m., depending on the severity. And this can be fairly inconvenient for the patient, cause similar clinical symptoms, but overall seems to cause less functional impairment and in some ways can be fairly adaptive to our modern day work-life culture. You know, where delayed phase sleepers can often be viewed as like late lazy or irresponsible due to their sleep patterns. Advanced phase sleepers are the early birds. They're more responsible. You know, they're typically the first ones in the office in the early morning time, always seem to be on their A games at like that early seven or eight o'clock meeting. So patients don't tend to seek treatment as much for this disorder unless it's very severe. And similar to delayed phase disorder, they, there have been certain genetic variants that are associated with this disorder. Okay, next is non 24 hour sleep disorder. This is when we already talked about that circadian drift found in high prevalence in that non sighted population due to their inability to send light signals to their master clock. So they rely on their free running clocks. And then finally, there's irregular sleep wake rhythm disorder, as depicted by this figure on the right. Now, this involves highly irregular sleep wake cycles without any type of discernible circadian pattern as we see there. Now, this is typically caused by underlying injury or destruction of the hypothalamus, either by neurodegenerative disease or traumatic brain injury. And this makes sense if you think about it. Remember that our suprachiasmatic nuclei resides in our hypothalamus. So destruction of our master pacemaker is gonna wreak havoc on those, you know, 24 hour consistent daily oscillations. And so those are the four intrinsic circadian sleep disorders in a nutshell. For these last few minutes, I just wanna focus on a few treatment principles for intrinsic sleep disorders, especially as they pertain again to delayed phase sleep disorder. So we now know that circadian sleep disturbances they can arise from either intrinsic or extrinsic factors. And sometimes it's a combination of both of these things as we discussed with delayed phase sleep disorder, intrinsic and extrinsic. Well, in regard to treatments, we don't currently have any medications for the intrinsic side of things, those biologic or genetic factors that might be contributing to delayed sleep. So the treatment is currently based on strengthening those extrinsic circadian signals to essentially help phase correct those intrinsic clocks.
And we know the role that light and melatonin play in phase shifting, and that both of these things are now readily available in artificial form. And so the question then becomes, can artificial light and exogenous melatonin be effective treatments for intrinsic circadian sleep disorders like delayed phase sleep? And the answer is possibly. So the first thing I need to say is that melatonin is not FDA approved for any indication. So it's use in treatment of any circadian sleep disorder is off label. Having said that, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine have provided some treatment guidelines for intrinsic circadian sleep disorders. And you can see on the left here that they made the recommendations either for or against a specific treatment. And these recommendations were either weak or strong based on the strength of the existing evidence. So on the right, I actually wrote out some of their recommendations and we see for delayed phase sleep disorder that for adults, they give a weak recommendation for strategically timed melatonin. And for children and adolescents, they give a weak recommendation for strategically timed melatonin and morning time light therapy. So again, this doesn't mean they recommend against morning time light therapy in adults, there's just insufficient data to make a recommendation either way. And actually, if you notice, all of these treatment recommendations for light therapy and exogenous melatonin are weak, meaning there's a lower degree of clinical certainty for net benefits based on the existing evidence. And I think this is important to acknowledge to ourselves and to the patient that clinical evidence is not robustly convincing for benefit. Now, these guidelines were last updated back in 2015. Since that time, there have been new clinical trials that do further suggest benefit of light therapy and exogenous melatonin for delayed phase sleep disorder. And I want to point two of these out real briefly. Both were published back in 2018. But this top study is significant in the fact that it's the largest placebo-controlled double-blind trial to date to assess that efficacy of exogenous melatonin in delayed phase sleep disorder. And briefly, the study included 116 patients with delayed phase sleep who then completed a four-week trial of either melatonin or placebo administration. And we see that the melatonin treatment actually resulted in 34-minute earlier sleep times and 36-minute earlier wake times compared to placebo. So essentially, treatment advanced their sleep clocks by about 35 minutes. And these results actually exceeded consensus for clinical efficacy by more than double. So a fairly robust clinical study with fairly convincing results. Well, the study below briefly examines artificial light therapy for patients with delayed phase sleep. And they studied 60 patients aged 13 to 24 who were then randomized to receive light upon waking either on the screen or red spectrum of light. And after three weeks of treatment, patient sleep onset advanced by about 39 minutes, wake times by about 43 minutes. So again, an average clock advancement of about 40 minutes. And so this isn't a deep dive into either of these studies or really the clinical literature in general, but I think an accurate clinical summary would be to say that the net benefits for either light therapy or exogenous melatonin for delayed phase sleep is not entirely certain. We're still figuring it out, but there is clinical evidence that does suggest benefit. And when we measure this benefit against the low risks of either treatment, as well as the lack of better treatment alternatives, these can be viewed as reasonable treatment strategies in the right clinical situation. And so in regards to actual light therapy for delayed phase sleep disorder, there's currently no gold standard treatment guidelines. So a lot of treatment practices are based on those physiological principles of light we discussed earlier, timing, intensity, duration, and spectrum. Now on the left is a nice chart that just kind of simplifies some of the timing principles we discussed earlier for your reference. Um, but remember that patients with delayed phase sleep, they're going to bed and waking up too late in that solar phase. So we want to phase advance their circadian clocks. And so in addition to avoiding evening and nighttime light, we also want to expose them to as much morning time light as possible. And the general rule is to typically just have them use that light box as soon around awakening in the morning as possible. And then they can slowly advance the exposure like 10, 15, 30 minutes per day as they tolerate until they reach their target wake times.
for intensity, you want a light between like five and 10,000 lux, basically the same intensity as that bright sunny day. And fortunately, most light boxes, they come in this 10,000 lux range. So, so you don't have to think about it too hard, but there is a pitfall. And that is that you need to remember that this intensity is only valid for a certain distance usually like one to four feet, depending on the light box manufacturer. So it's important that the patient adheres to the specified distance and actually does things like face the light box with their eyes open. You know, they can't simply just turn the light box on and then leave the room or turn around to read a book as this person is doing in this photo down here. And just remember retina mediates all effects of light. So that light has to make contact with their retina. Well, in terms of duration, the current recommendation is like 30 to 60 minutes and longer duration may be even more beneficial if they can tolerate this. For spectrum, while we are more sensitive to those blue light waves, a lot of the literature actually recommends to avoid blue light lamps as these haven't really been shown to be clinically superior, while at the same time they increase our potential exposure to harmful UV rays. Remember that those UV rays are very close on the spectrum to blue light. So the general rule is to get what's called a broad spectrum light, which is white light. It includes all of the light spectrum, including blue, but will then filter out those harmful UV rays. And if you do end up getting a blue, blue light box, just make sure that it specifies that they are uh, filtering out those UV rays. Now, similar to light, there's no gold standard treatment guidelines for melatonin either. So again, it's mainly based on those physiologic principles that we talked about earlier. For timing, it's thought to be most effective when given prior to our GILMO, or that endogenous melatonin onset. Now, measuring DILMO is not a typical clinical practice. I've never done it. I'm assuming most of you have not. So this is often estimated based on average sleep times through things like actigraphy or sleep diaries. And this is where they can come in handy, not just for diagnostics, but also to help guide therapeutic, <clears throat> excuse me, therapeutics. So recall that a general rule is that our DILMO often happens about two hours prior to sleep. So sleep literature will suggest giving melatonin anywhere from like two to six hours prior to the patient's average sleep time to increase that likelihood that it's given prior to DILMO. And like we talked about earlier as well, phase shifting does not appear to be dose dependent. So smaller doses of like 0.5 milligrams to one milligram are actually recommended. And in fact, higher doses may lead to more problems. For instance, if we take super high doses, you know, like 10 milligrams or more, this is gonna lead to very high blood plasma levels as I reference here on the right. Um, and these high blood plasma levels may not be able to be fully metabolized or eliminated by that late morning time, which as we know in theory can actually contribute to a phase delay. So it can kind of work against us. So, you know, the big takeaways being don't take too much melatonin at night and also don't take it too late at night. And this identifies an important principle that patients need to know why they're taking the melatonin. If they just view this as like a sleep aid per se, they're more likely to take it incorrectly, like right before they go to bed, and are more likely to maybe give up after it, almost, after like one or two nights of taking it, if they don't experience like a strong hypnotic effect that they might be expecting from a typical sleep aid. So it's important to just tell them that this is a darkness signal. It may provide a mild sopophoric or sedating effect, but it's not necessarily gonna help them fall asleep. Rather, the goal is that over time, it can help shift sleep to an earlier time in the night, if taken correctly and in conjunction with good sleep and circadian hygiene. And this leads to the final point of the presentation, that circadian hygiene must be prioritized. And I fully acknowledge my own hypocrisy in telling you to prioritize this as I kind of squeeze it into the last 30 seconds of my presentation. But just remember that artificial light and exogenous melatonin therapies, they're there to help strengthen circadian amplitudes, that these are supposed to be supplements, not substitutes. So if the patient isn't also adhering to good sleep and circadian hygiene, this treatment is essentially like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. It's not nearly gonna be as effective and certainly won't be sustained over any period of time. So taking the time 
to educate the patient on these principles, identifying lifestyle patterns that might be contributing to their delayed sleep, and then strategizing behavioral interventions to help them, is gonna help them most effectively begin this process of treatment. And yes, it's possible that artificial light and exogenous melatonin may play a role along the way, but it's also possible that the patient may realize that what they really needed all along, perhaps something we all need, is just a little more darkness. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much again for spending this hour with me. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. O'Donnell um, at St. Alphonsus in the Sleep and Pulmonary Clinic for being my mentor, uh, Dr. Frizzell and Dr. Brown for also giving me feedback on this presentation to kind of help me make it more effective. And, um, you know, here's my bibliography. And um, we don't have a ton of time, but I'm happy to, you know, take any questions now. I love talking about this stuff. So if anyone has any questions down the road, you're also free to get a hold of me and we can chat more about this stuff. I'm happy to share any references as well with you or email papers um, that I found most helpful for learning about this stuff. Um, but anyway, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming, everyone. Oh, thank you. I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm just barely opening this ch chat box. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, thank you, Jazz Deep. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Julia and Dr. Fox. Dr. Johnson, that was amazing. A really great presentation. And I learned a lot. And I just want to clarify one thing for me. So are you saying if people take too much melatonin, it can delay their sleep phase even further? Is, did I take, is that correct? Yeah, let me pull up the slide here. So in theory, yes, there's very little clinical and laboratory literature um, on this, but the literature we do have suggests that excess melatonin in the plasma in that morning time is gonna contribute to a phase delay. Um, and so, yeah, basically the point being, if we take super high doses of melatonin at nighttime, it's gonna build up in our blood plasma. We're not gonna have time to metabolize it. So it's gonna be kind of sticking around in the morning time. And this makes sense physiologically, if you think about it, again, melatonin is that darkness signal. So it's basically telling our suprachiasmatic nuclei, whoa, it's still nighttime right now. We need to be asleep. We should not be awake and alert. We need to delay you know, our sleep to a later time, if that makes sense. But again, a lot of this is kind of off physiologic theories and not a ton of good robust clinical evidence. But we know that bigger doses don't necessarily help either. And so really there's potential risks, not a lot of benefits. So keeping those doses low just makes sense. That's really helpful. I'm going to add that into my little spiel when I talk with patients who are like, well, Dr. Allen, I've been taking 50 milligrams of my melatonin. <laughs> so that this is really helpful. I can hopefully convince them that they're doing more harm than good that way. And they're trying to they're not doing what their goal is. Um, and then I just, a comment as you're talking this time, I'm just thinking about whenever I go camping, how my sleep cycle is so much better um, because there's no artificial light and maybe we should just prescribe some camping for our patients um, or some outdoor activities. Um, but thank you for, for this talk. It was amazing and I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad you made that comment on camping because the literature supports what you say. Um, and I, I took this out because I didn't think we were going to have time to go over it, but they, they do, there are clinical studies that basically take patients with delayed phase sleep disorder, and then they take them camping, where they only have like a, a, a campfire at nighttime as their light source. And this is one of them right here, this right at Al back in 2013. The, the sample size is fairly small. I think it's only like 15 patients. But basically a week of camping successfully phase shifted their clocks by about 1.2 hours with no other intervention. So again, completely agree. If you feel stuck with a patient, yeah, send them to REI. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Johnson, uh, I heard some time ago that one of the problems with doing a lot of screen time toward bedtime mm 
is that something about blue light and and it messing with your sleep cycle, which made some sense from what you said about more blue light being available in the middle of the day? Absolutely, yeah. So let me try to find my slide again, sorry. Um, so you're right, uh, there's a lot of, um, here we go. So yeah, there, there's a lot about blue light right now. And, and bottom line is we are, light kind of affects us, four variables of light affect us, and that's the duration of light exposure, intensity, um, the timing, and then the spectrum. And so blue light we're most sensitive to. And it's, it's a pretty popular topic right now, uh, but sometimes I feel like it's a little bit overblown. While we are most sensitive to blue light, and while it's important to be cognizant of this, this should not be the only thing we avoid. And I think one big pitfall for this is like, you know, getting those blue light, you know, goggles at nighttime and things of that nature, which can be beneficial to block out those blue light, but it's not going to eliminate the other variables that can also impact on our circadian system. So for instance, you know, if your patients wear those, make sure that they still know that they can't then sit in front of the TV for three hours for a law and order marathon, because <laughs> that duration is going to be just as impactful. Um, there's no good literature to suggest which kind of variable is most impactful. They've done some studies between like duration versus intensity, what impacts us the most. It's still not entirely clear. So we kind of want to honor all four of these variables. So yeah, be cognizant of blue light, but don't, don't have that be the only thing that you're avoiding in terms of light. Also intensity and duration is a big one. Thank you. So so walking around in the dark and getting a drink with the uh, with uh, with the lights off, and when you open the fridge, you uh, kind of blow close your eyes and grab the water out, and then close the fridge. Then <laughs> that work better. <laughs> That's what I do. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, keep those eyes closed. And and this is where it's really hard in that modern day you know environment because even if you really try to adhere to these good circadian principles, you know you might do a really good job of avoiding like light exposure, but then you go into the bathroom to brush your teeth, you turn on just those super bright, intense bathroom lights that just kind of pulse you out. And so yeah, modern day society just raises a lot of challenges with this, but yeah. Excellent presentation, thanks Don. Thank you. Well, I think it's one o'clock right now. Again, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to always talk about this. But again, thank you for spending the hour with me and um, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off.